This is Russell Fagan, aka Sinistral Rifleman. And this is my video to discuss my first AR that I acquired during the Federal Assault Weapons Ban, my period rebuild, and match use of that rebuild. Growing up in the 1980s into the 1990s, my initial interest in military style firearms was sparked by movies and video games. My father was a traditional Michigan hunter, and while he owned handguns for self defense, Military style rifles were not something that he owned. Movies and games made military style firearms appealing to me in two ways. The first is that the capabilities of these firearms were so much greater than any of the hunting style firearms that we possessed in our family. From a technological standpoint, these types of firearms were just so much more interesting than a traditional hunting rifle. The second thing is that as shown in movies and games, they even the odds. In the hands of a skilled protagonist, he could use them to overcome the odds, or at the very least make the aggressors pay more dearly before he was overwhelmed. Culturally, we still believed in good versus evil and in rugged individualism. In my preteen years, I had the beginning of a concept that a man with a rifle was still the master of his own destiny. But I wouldn't consciously think about wanting to own one of these rifles myself until later. I have a very distinct memory of sitting at the breakfast table with my dad in 1994 at 12 years old, and reading an article in the Detroit Free Press with an infographic about all the different guns that were going to be banned and their specifications. Somehow I just knew at this time that if the government didn't want us to have these guns, I wanted some of them myself. I wasn't alone in this opinion. Many Americans who had not cared about military-style firearms before now suddenly did. If people aren't going to be able to get something ever again, they will want it. And it's only natural that people raised on stories of the Revolutionary War, including the Battle of Lexington and Concord, being kicked off by an attempt by the British to seize firearms would feel this way. The Federal Assault Weapons Ban drew interest to these firearms in a way the industry itself never could have. It is directly responsible for creating the AR-15 industry as we know it today. From 1994 to 2004, more AR-15 companies stood up to produce these rifles than had ever existed before. More AR-15 rifles were sold during this time than the previous 30 years combined. There have been a number of sales surges since the 1994 ban, but I cannot emphasize enough how much of a catalyst this was in creating the gun market as we know it now. In this video, I'm going to confine the discussion to the effect the ban had on rifles. The 1994 to 2004 ban defined an assault rifle as the following. Semi-automatic rifles able to accept a detachable magazine and two or more of the following features. Folding or telescoping stock, pistol grip, bayonet mount, flash hider or threaded barrel designed to accommodate one, or a grenade launcher. The sale of newly manufactured magazines holding more than 10 rounds was also restricted to military and law enforcement use only. Everything in circulation before September 13, 1994 was still legal to own, possess, and transfer between private citizens. The one feature on the list that everyone kept was the pistol grip. This meant changes that were largely cosmetic to the guns themselves and some that were just annoying to deal with. Rifles either came with bare muzzles with no threads or permanently attached compensators or muzzle brakes. Manufacturers would submit muzzle devices to ATF Tech Branch for testing that they did not reduce flash. These muzzle devices would be pinned in place either with taper pins or threaded on and pinned and welded like we do with 14.5 inch barrels today. A bare muzzle just looks wrong on an AR and the barrel crown is unprotected from damage. Comps and brakes help reduce muzzle climb or recoil at the cost of increased blast and flash. The real downside here is having a muzzle device installed meant you were married to it unless you wanted to pay for more gunsmithing work or get a new barrel. I do need to note that suppressors were also considered flash hiders. So if you wanted to use a suppressor on an AR-15, it needed to be a pre-band configuration if you wanted to maintain the pistol grip. Telestocks weren't nearly as popular until people were told they couldn't have them. M16A1 and A2 looking rifles were the most common with fixed stocks before the ban. The media and events that would really make carbines more popular had not happened yet. Not having telestocks did make sizing stocks for short or tall people more difficult. Some people would pin and epoxy telestocks in place at the length they liked them. Shorter stocks like the RRA entry also entered the market. The grenade launcher language also meant that muzzle devices couldn't accept rifle grenades. Like telestocks, the bayonet lug restriction just made people want them more. People who owned pre ban guns modified them to have as many features as they could. A lot of AR-15A2s got turned into CAR-15s and later M4s. The prices on pre ban guns steadily rose over the time period of the ban. 
A typical price on a post-band gun around this time frame was $750 to $850. Pre-band guns would sell for $1,200 to $2,000 depending on the configuration and make. The further into the band we got, the more desirable and higher priced pre-band guns became. At the end of the band, pre-band lowers by themselves were selling for $1,000 or more. My parents were always supportive of my interest in firearms, and with my mother's assistance I acquired a Bushmaster Dissipator for my 17th birthday in 1999. It would of course become my rifle fully the following year when I turned 18. I picked the Bushmaster Dissipator because Bushmaster was one of the few companies with a good reputation during this time frame. The 16-inch barrel with full-length handguards just looked better than having a 16-inch barrel with carbine sight radius and carbine handguards. The longer handguards also protected the shooter's hand and body if you went to sling it when the barrel was hot. I went with an A2 carry handle upper, even though flat tops were already available, because I didn't want to have to immediately spend more money on a detached carry handle or a flip-up rear sight to be able to shoot the rifle right away. I later added an Aimpoint Comp M in drop-down carry handle mount, and I had a local gunsmith thread the barrel and permanently install a Levang linear compensator. I reconfigured this rifle several times over the years before eventually all of the original components, including the lower receiver, were sold and gone. Coming up on 20 years after acquiring my first AR-15, I was feeling nostalgic and wanted to rebuild something similar to what I had in 1999. I acquired a 1990s vintage Bushmaster Dissipator Upper from a local that was selling it off to upgrade his rifle into a more modern configuration. This is the configuration of Dissipator Upper I wish I could have found in 1999, but ordering guns online really wasn't a thing yet and none of the local dealers had it. This model has a fluted heavy barrel, saving about a half a pound of weight over the H-bar that my original Dissipator was. It also has a permanently attached AK-74 muzzle brake that slipped over and pinned with a taper pin. These brakes are very effective at reducing muzzle climb and recoil at the cost of increased blast and noise, particularly punishing to anyone next to the shooter. Between the brake and a bare muzzle though, I'll take the brake every time. It protects the muzzle crown if you're doing anything more dynamic than shooting on a square range, and it just looks visually better than a bare barrel. When I acquired this upper, the front sight was canted way to the left, making it impossible to zero the irons. To correct this, I had to beat on it with a three pound hammer and then peen the barrel indexing pin to take up the slop in the upper slot to prevent it from slewing back over to the left. It now is zeroed, but I'm using up about half of the windage to do so. While I did say that Bushmaster was one of the better regarded brands of the late 1990s, the two common complaints people had with them were canted front sights and purplish looking anodizing. Test firing this upper I found another problem. The left round of the magazine consistently kept hitting the transition point between the barrel extension and the upper receiver itself, failing to feed. M4 feed ramps were not used commercially during this time frame. To remedy this problem, I used a Dremel tool to polish the transition between the upper and the barrel extension. The marks you see in the upper in this photo are the result of that. Doing this polishing resolved this feeding issue and the gun worked reliably afterwards. I paired this upper to one of my KE-15 forged lower receivers with mil-spec fire control group. There really hasn't been any changes to forged lowers over the years, so this is period correct aside from the markings. I did make a few compromises versus what I actually used in 1999 to accommodate for my modern shooting preferences. Ambidextrous controls, including selector and magazine catch, were available back then, but I wasn't using them. I also opted to use an A1 length stock rather than the A2 that was standard on the Dissipator in 1999. Even though I'm 6 feet tall, using the A2 stock is annoying at this point. After years of shooting CAV-15 Mark IIs and having my telestock set at the same 13 inch length of pull. One final compromise is I used an Aimpoint Comp M2 rather than a Comp M. They're visually identical, they both have 4 MOA dots, but the Comp M2 has a battery life roughly 10 times longer than that of the Comp M. The Comp M had an original battery life of 100 to 1000 hours, so going to the Comp M2 is a substantial improvement on battery life. It's just over 20 years ago that I acquired my first AR-15, and 15 years ago this month that the Federal Assault Weapons Ban sunsetted on September 14, 2004. 
With these things in mind, it felt appropriate to use my Ban Era rebuild at the September 2019 Rio Black Rifle match. Staying with the 1999 theme, I'm using only USGI magazines with original mag pulls on my reloads. I'm also using a Period Eagle tactical vest that could hold up to a total of 12 magazines, although I only use these pouches to hold single magazines. If you're not concerned about wearing armor, this style of tactical vest is very comfortable and it's very quick to put on in a hurry, much quicker than contemporary chest rigs. You don't necessarily need to zip up the front, you can just throw it on and wear it open style which actually helps with venting heat. I'm also fond of green BDUs with the black tack vest because it's that 1990s SG-1 aesthetic. Don't give me grief for not using a P90 with this configuration, I'd rather shoot Gould with a 5.56 than 5.7. This stage has steel targets at 100, 200, and 300 yards. The shooting order is supposed to be array 1, then 2, then 3, then 2, then 1, from both positions. You're going to get to watch me make an epic mistake here that's the result of chatting with people too much before my turn and not internalizing the stage description. I shoot arrays 1, then 2, then 3, then 1, then 2, then 3 from the second position and I'm about ready to unload and show clear, but the tone of the RO lets me know that I've screwed up and I have something more to address. I move to readdress arrays two, then one, then move back to the first position. I incur a procedural penalty for doing things out of sequence. Fortunately, that procedural penalty is only five seconds. Shooting sports are mental as much as they are about shooting skill. There's two ways to handle a situation like this. You can get angry at yourself and screw up the rest of the day, or you can laugh it off and move on with the day and still have a good time. Even with that epic screw up, I end up second in limited division with 94.04% of the winner's score. Overall, I'm 19th with 64.34% of the winner's score. On this stage, there is an array of three targets at 300 yards and an array of two targets at 400 yards. You'll see the red lights flash when hits are made. There's two things that are more difficult about using this rifle versus a modern limited division rifle. The first is the trigger. A mil-spec GI trigger can be just as accurate as a match trigger like I'm used to shooting, but it requires much more patience and work to accomplish the same result. The second is that the sight picture is occluded with the irons, and I'm actually looking over top of the rear sight to see the dot. So the sight picture is a bit busier, and it requires more visual focus to put the dot on the target versus having an unobstructed red dot sight picture. I end up first in limited division on this stage, giving me 100 match points. Overall, I'm 14th with 65.12% of the winner's score. On this stage, I find out that the 1990s era extractor spring isn't so good anymore. I have a spent casing that fails to eject, trying to feed back into the action, along with a live round. Now remember what I said about requiring more work to accomplish the same result with a mil-spec trigger. I get sloppy here because I'm frustrated and I'm expecting the rifle to malfunction again after that first malfunction. Otherwise, I'd normally require a lot less rounds to make those hits. Here I get back in the zone and make these hits rapidly on the targets at distance. The last round fired though is another bad malfunction. This time the spent casing is between the bolt and the charging handle. This would have been really ugly to clear on the clock. Reviewing the malfunctions with one of the other limited shooters, Brandon, we came to the conclusion that the problem might be a weak extractor spring, causing the casings to drop before they were ejected out of the upper. Fortunately, Brandon had an extra enhanced extractor spring and rubber bumper for me to install my bolt carrier group to try on the next stage. Even with that malfunction, I'm second in limited division with 72.52% of the winner's score. 
Overall, I'm 28th with 66.10% of the winner's score. This stage starts out with some even smaller steel plates at about 50 yards. I focus on this and do some nice clean trigger presses going one for one on all six of them. Inside the chopper, the shooter must engage three steel targets at about 300 yards from two positions. The challenge with this prop for me is always getting stable enough, particularly from the front position. From the second position, I successfully hit two of the steel targets at 300. I use up the rest of the magazine attempting to hit the final target. With every shot fired, the chopper bounces and vibrates around even more. And without magnification, it's difficult to see where my hits are going. Shooting from this prop, particularly this position, is the single most challenging thing I encounter at these matches. It keeps coming up, so I need to put more energy into figuring out what the best way to engage targets from it is. Nonetheless, running the magazine out proves that the extractor spring was the problem, and the rifle continues to run without problems for the rest of the match. Being sloppy and incurring a penalty on this stage leaves me at 5th with 50.37% of the winner's score. Overall, I'm 51st with 44.48% of the winner's score. Unlike the first stage, I actually remember the engagement sequence on this one. There are three steel targets at 100 yards to be engaged first, then three steel targets at 200, then back to the original three at 100. Russell Jack Boot Vegan. It's parting like it's nineteen ninety five. This position feels a bit more stable than mag potting from over top of the concrete bunker. Here I'm able to reverse kneel and support off the railing. On this stage, I'm fourth and limited with 56.98% of the winner's score. Overall, I'm 34th with 50.17% of the winner's score. In the end, I'm second out of six in limited with 82.34% of the winner's score. Overall, I'm 27th out of 76 shooters with 68.52% of the winner's score. Considering my mental malfunction on the first stage combined with my mechanical malfunction on the third stage, and the fact I'm using retro equipment with no mechanical advantages versus completely modern equipment, I'm content with how this match turned out. While this rifle, equipment, and accessories may not seem that old to some, using it gives me an appreciation for how much better off we have it today than we did 20 years ago. There are so many more options today for getting a quality rifle out of the box or building one yourself to the exact specifications you want than there were 20 years ago. In 1999, this rifle was valued at about $800. In 2019 money, that translates to about $1,200. Consider how much more quality you can get in 2019 for $1,200 and how many improved features are available versus this basic rifle that went for the same value in 1999. Isolated, incremental improvements may not seem like a big deal, but when they're added all together, those little advantages can become a substantial advantage over guns of the past. Fortunately, the assault weapons ban was allowed to expire in 2004, bringing on a renaissance of development within the firearms industry that had been stifled for a decade. Every time a ban is proposed, whether that be at a state level or a national level, a buying surge occurs. The American people don't like to be told what they can and can't own. As long as Americans maintain their sense of independence and rugged individualism, and young people grow up watching movies and playing games that spark their interests, the desire to own the most modern capable firearms will continue. There are tens of millions of modern semi-automatic rifles in circulation, 
and potentially hundreds of millions of high capacity magazines. Any attempt to regulate these items with them being as ubiquitous as they are is ultimately doomed to fail. Hopefully this has been enlightening for those of you who did not experience the assault weapons ban firsthand, whether it's because you're too young, weren't born yet, or weren't engaged with the firearms community at the time. For those of you who did experience it, post your ban memories in the comments. I'm interested to see what other people's experiences were and what got you involved in these type of firearms. Thank you for watching. Come back again for more match and multi-gun competition content.